Content warning. This video features a lot of big downers. If you're having a rough day, maybe just enjoy this picture of Phoebe and come back to this one when you're feeling a little bit better. The rallying cry after the horrors of the Holocaust came to light was simple, but unbelievably important. Never again. The way Germany's fascist regime got to the point where it murdered over 17 million sisters, brothers, mothers and fathers should never be repeated. Frequently, the term never again is invoked referring to anti-Semitism and dehumanizing rhetoric, the kind which allowed such mass-scale murder to occur. But I'd like to add something to the solemn vow humanity should take. Never again should apply to the circumstances which led to fascism coming to power in Germany. The story of interwar Germany, or the Weimar Republic as we often call it today, should be a parable for the world to etch forever into its consciousness. So, as part of my series on dead countries, let's tell the dark, sad tale of the Weimar Republic. Hi, this is Step Back History, I'm Tristan Johnson. The Weimar Republic, our dead country of today, was born of another dead country before it. In late 1918, the German Empire was, for lack of a better word, exhausted. Germany was the center of the most destructive war in human history at that point, World War I. A last ditch attempt to turn the war around earlier in the year had failed. With the United States joining their enemies, it appeared the writing was on the wall. The empire tried to reform the government in October to allow for more democracy and create less instability at home, but Germany was en route to a massive upheaval. A rebellion broke loose among soldiers, sailors, and workers, something especially scary to the ruling class of Germany, as the Communist Soviet Union's revolution the year before followed a very similar path. The rebellion turned into a revolution and began to spread around Germany. Among them were the two major left-wing political parties, both calling themselves the Social Democrats, but divided on economics and support for the war. The support of the war is an essential key to this story, as it broke those Social Democrats off more or less from other socialist currents of the time and isolated them. The rebellion made the German right and centrist terrified for their country, seeing the example in Russia to the east. This is another important note. Socialists and communists were getting more popular around the world. In response, liberals and conservatives were more and more anxious about losing their ill-gotten gains and would go to greater and greater lengths to defend it. Pro-war Social Democrats declared a new German Republic on November 9th. A free socialist republic rival government announced itself literally two hours later and two kilometers away by co-leaders Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg. They together led a more Soviet-style Spartacist League. Seeing that the end of the monarchy was nigh, the Chancellor of the Imperial Government handed Germany over to the Social Democrats, who formed a coalition with the pro-war, not-communist rebels. It effectively ended the monarchy, but still opposed the rival Spartacist League. Two days later, the new government signed an armistice with the Allies and ended the First World War. This left Germany defeated and in a state of political chaos. The new Social Democratic government in Germany pushed through radical reforms in the days after forming a government, while also trying to keep the military loyal to this new regime. The deal made with the military to keep it loyal made the centrists happy, but turned the radical left and the radical right against the government. The left didn't see the value in promising to avoid military reforms as part of working class interests, and the far right didn't like that their precious troops were lowering themselves by working with a democratically elected government. They saw democracy as a sign of weakness. By Christmas, the Social Democratic government was using the military to put down leftist mutinies, and the far left began to splinter off and rally around the Spartacists. In January of 1919, these forces led an uprising against the government, which was forcibly put down by pro-government paramilitary forces. In the fighting, Luxembourg and Liebknecht were captured, beaten, and executed. 
Those who did set execution without trial were let off the hook, and from that point the left did not trust this new German government. There was one more attempt to make a social state in Munich, but it was quickly brought down as well. What came from this chaos was the Weimar Republic. The name was actually given to it later because of the city in which the first National Assembly sat, but interesting to point out is that this country never did have a solid official name. It often went by the German Reich, but it had imperial connotations which didn't really apply anymore. This government had enemies all over the place. Not only had they abandoned the left, but many in the right and the center considered them traitors to the empire. A pervasive myth flourished that Germany had only surrendered because the people turned on the war. They didn't support the troops enough, despite the German economy being utterly defeated and American allies ballooning enemy numbers. These nationalists blamed socialists, Jews, and disloyal citizens. Hang on to that strange conspiracy, we're going to need it later. So now we had a post-war German Republic. Congratulations! Now this country on very shaky foundations needed to deal with horrible crippling problems. Germans struggled to eat and things just didn't seem to get better, even after the removal of naval blockades and the resumption of trade. To many a German, the government was already off to a bad start. Then there was also the problem of dealing with the peace treaty after the war. The Treaty of Versailles, which set terms for the end of the war, removed all the German colonies and shrunk the country's size by about 13%. It imposed intense restrictions and reparation fees on a country already struggling to feed itself. The humiliations Germany experienced in the wake of the First World War made nationalists go ballistic. They developed that conspiracy theory I mentioned earlier that Jews and socialists were behind the surrender and turned it into a horrible mixture of scapegoating and impotent rage. And things were poised to get even worse. The Weimar government trying to pay off reparations while also recovering from the war took out massive loans from American bankers. It's important to mention here that many history textbooks tend to tell this story with reparations as a big part of it. However, the Weimar Republic actually managed to negotiate some leniency here. So it was not as bad as often told, but Germans very much didn't see it that way. The government printed money to pay these massive debts, which led to massive inflation. This is the process in which a growing money supply makes each individual German mark less valuable. Some inflation is normal, but what Germany experienced in the post-war period was nothing short of gigantic. Like, prices increasing over 100 billion fold gigantic. People shopped with wheelbarrows of money and used cash to insulate their walls and burned it to heat their homes. The Germans defaulted on loan payments leading to occupations of one of their most industrialized regions. Widespread strikes and occupation reduced their ability to make commodities, which further exacerbated their financial problems. On top of that, political violence never entirely died out. The far left wanted a Soviet-styled socialist republic. The far right wanted to go back to the authoritarian dictatorship of the old German Empire days. Literally, make Germany great again. The two fought the government and each other in the streets and to do said fighting, both maintained paramilitary groups. In 1923, Adolf Hitler leading the Nazi party tried to head a far-right coup of the government, but failed. And the harsh punishment put on Hitler for treason was five years in prison. And like, not even prison, he got to live in more or less a castle with his friends and work on Mein Kampf. You see, the judge on his case thought Hitler was onto something, and not only gave him the lightest possible sentence, he also let Hitler basically make his case for the Nazi party in court and permitted journalists to publish it far and wide. So Hitler was gaining fans and writing his manifesto while lounging as his punishment. Meanwhile, while Hitler was thinking of more legal ways to subvert democracy, the Weimar Republic had a period of relative stability. Political violence declined, the economy stabilized, and it was almost okay. And in this okayness, Germany became one of the most progressive, if not the most progressive countries on earth. They had universal suffrage for those over 20. Women got into the American flapper girl movement and art, cinema, literature, theater, and music all went through a massive renaissance. One part of the story which is often overlooked is the fantastic research and progressive attitudes forming towards LGBTQ plus people in this period. Thinkers like Magnus Hirschfeld led campaigns for gay rights in the 1920s, when most other countries, the best you could hope for is that the police would look the other way. Oh, oh, hey, look, I made a video about the gay life in New York in the 1920s. 
you should go give that a watch. Link in the description. At the German Institute für Sexualwissenschaft. I'll just put the text down here because there's no way I'm going to be doing that one right. They even pioneered many of the medical breakthroughs for trans people, including the first sex reassignment surgeries. In the infamous Nazi book burnings, the archive knowledge of this institute was what they burned. Valuable information and the progress of trans rights were set back decades. There's so much more. There were significant changes for workers' rights with laws to control the length of the work week. Health insurance became a bigger deal along with general improvement and expansion of social services, assistance for veterans and people with disabilities and the welfare state. Heck, even universal education and child protection all were paid with the introduction of progressive taxation. Now, remember when I said that this growth was primarily funded by loans from American bankers? Well, in 1929, the United States experienced a major stock market crash, a subject I feel could be a good video in and of itself, actually. American banks turned off their loans as the American economy began to crumble and fall apart. The effect on Germany was catastrophic. Unemployment exploded. Around the world, liberal economies were collapsing. The centrists could not hold on to their grip on society. So, seeing liberalism fail, many turned to the one country not experiencing recession, the USSR. Communism was on the rise, but at the same time, nationalists and the far right argued that it was democracy which had failed. They thought minorities schemed against their country, that the disabled were burdens on the state. To save Germany, they felt they had to go back to a mythologized past. This manifested in 1930 with the election of the Nazi party to 19% of the German government or Reichstag. The Weimar Republic was now in a period of political instability again. With the Nazis winning a surprisingly high number of seats, the government was no longer able to form a coalition of pro-democracy parties. As attempts to fix the economy through conservative austerity failed, more and more of the capitalist class and working class turned towards Hitler. The conservatives, also not the biggest fans of democracy, began to make overtures to the Nazis. They lifted the ban on the Nazis' storm detachment, the paramilitary wing of the party to try and appease Hitler and keep a conservative hold on power. However, this didn't work, and the Nazis still opposed the conservatives, forcing yet another election in 1932. This is the election where support for the conservatives and centrists really gave out, and both the Nazis and the communists made massive gains. The Nazis got 37% of the popular vote, which would be the high watermark of their support in a democratic election. But as we Canadians learned in 2011, you can have a surprisingly small number of the popular vote and still get power. We did it because our electoral system is even more outdated than this one. Hitler and the Nazis did it with the help of longtime enablers of the far right, the conservatives and the centrists. The conservatives to hold power made a coalition with nationalists and Nazis to form a new government and in that agreement made Hitler the chancellor. Conservatives thought Hitler was silly and laughable and in the chancellorship could be kept under control. The Nazis had a very different plan and saw this as the beginning of their rule. Soon after coming into office, Hitler's government clamped down hard on any groups which opposed him and made participation in left-wing groups a crime. That paramilitary group the Nazis had regularly assaulted and murdered leftists and Jews. Then, less than a month into Hitler's chancellorship, the Reichstag, the government building, was set on fire, an act of arson later reported to be set by the Nazis, but at the time blamed on communists. Hitler was quick to call it a communist plot to destroy the government, and used it to pass a decree severely hampering constitutional protections on civil liberties. The Nazis used the fire as a pretense to arrest and kill communists. In 1933, another election was held, but the conservative nationalist Nazi coalition couldn't form a majority, the seats for the centrists, social democrats, and communists just wouldn't budge. This would be the last multi-party election in Germany until the 1990s. The first acts of this new government would be to pass laws which gave the chancellor, president, and cabinet more direct control over the country. These acts also increased their ability to circumvent democratic procedures. They called this the Enabling Act. To pass it, they would need to change the constitution. And to do that, they needed at least 66% of the Reichstag to vote on it. Numbers they did not have. Hitler would have to get more votes, and quickly, the Nazis had their go-to reluctant ally. Centrists. 
Hitler began to work on a bipartisan solution to democracy by reaching out to the centrists, or more specifically, the Catholic Center Party. After a few small concessions, he managed to get center support. Over the next few days, Hitler portrayed the Nazis as a return to the glory of Imperial Germany. He gave the Catholic centrists a nod when introducing the Enabling Act, framing his work as the work of Christianity against the atheist left. The communist seats after the Reichstag fire were absent. The Social Democrats were the only voice in the room in favor of retaining democracy. All but the Social Democrats voted for the bill, and the next day, democracy had ended. The Weimar Republic was no more, and Nazi Germany had begun. Hitler's regime would continue to commit the worst atrocities in human history. Now we can look at this story and see what caused the German people to turn against democracy. There are several factors which I believe we should keep in mind if we're never to repeat what happened here again. The first factor was economics. Capitalism is prone to boom and bust cycles. The severe economic problems caused by unemployment, hyperinflation, and a drop in living standards caused many Germans to lose faith in the center's hold on power. The response to the economic downturn with austerity just made things worse. The desire for change of any kind made the government unstable, and eventually pushed for conservatives and centrists, afraid of communism, to abandon democracy, to hang on to their power and privilege. The turning of capitalists specifically to Hitler is very telling. The media also exacerbated factors. German media was interested in what sold newspapers, and Hitler, he sold newspapers. German and American, I might add, media figures knew the way to keep the cash flowing was to cover him. When Hitler rose to power, many in the West, who hated communism more than fascism, saw it as a good thing. Heck, famous American capitalists like Henry Ford and celebrities like Charles Lindbergh loved the Nazis. Lindbergh was even floated as a presidential candidate. Cultural acceptance of anti-Semitism and the widespread platforming of Nazi ideas increased their support. And on that note, I guess now, the part where I avoid talking about this in the context of our modern moment is over. Sorry, commenters but I couldn't tell this story without looking at how these signs are all in front of us right now. In many Western countries, you can probably see this story repeating all over again. We're in an economic downturn brought upon by the recession of 2008. Even with the recovery, the fact that after 2008, many of the jobs lost never came back, and most of the economic recovery went to a tiny class of people. People are losing their futures and livelihoods, and those afraid of wealth redistribution are turning to similar types of characters the old German conservatives and centrists did. And instead of blaming our economic system as they should, they've turned to scapegoating immigrants, Muslims, refugees, anything else. The far right is on the rise in many countries. Another recession is likely coming soon, and we're already seeing a mass displacement occurring as the planet becomes less habitable. Automation is taking away what little employment is left. Are we stuck on the same path as the Weimar Republic? Well, if you are to ask me, I actually think we can turn this around. Hear me out. This moment we're in is the result of the nature of the boom and bust cycle, as well as the wealth concentration that's indicative of capitalism. We need to realize things are going to get less stable, and that only by collectivizing the resources of this world are we all going to get through it okay. We need a model not based on unstable and unequal economics. Hitler wasn't some rogue genius for climbing to power. All he did was capitalize on the crisis of his day. And today, we're finding more and more people getting ready to do that themselves. The fall of the Weimar Republic to fascism is a story we don't tell often enough. But it should be. Every school kid should know this story. Everyone should hear it again and again and again in the memory of the millions who died. We should declare, never again. Oh boy, that was a dark one, and almost certainly demonetized. 
If you want to help me make more videos like this one, go to patreon.com slash stepbackhistory and join all of these wonderful people. A couple people also asked about P.O. boxes and Amazon wish lists, so I have those now and have put them down in the description. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more Step Back.